30% were foreign-born. Those foreign-born came mostly from Europe, including Italy and Germany, two of the Axis nations. War came to Europe in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland and set the entire, oh, I'm jumping ahead of myself, in 1940, New York City and America and the entire world were in the throes of the Great Depression. In the early part of the 30s, the economic situation had improved, but by 1937, the economy crashed again, and for the remainder of the decade, population struggled. New York City lived with an unemployment rate of about 25% through most of the Great Depression. War came to Europe in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland and set the entire continent aflame. America remained out of the conflict and faced considerable pressure to remain so. The ambassador to the court of St. James and father of a future president, Joseph Kennedy, warned President Roosevelt that the British would soon succumb to the Nazi bombardment of England. And we can do business with Mr. Hitler, he said. One of the most famous Americans, aviator Charles Lindbergh, <laughs> demanded that America remain isolated from the war in 1941, Lindbergh spoke in New York in behalf of the American First Committee, a popular na nationwide organization representing a range of anti-interventionist views. Speaking to 10,000 people inside of the Manhattan Center at 34th and 8th and via a loudspeaker to 25,000 supporters outside, uh, thronged outside and waiting for him. Lindbergh argued that Britain could not defeat Germany and should negotiate a peace. Americans, he said, should concentrate on national defense and not let the British protagonist and a small but influential group of American interventionists drag us into a hopeless war. Later that year, Lindbergh would identify the British, the Jews, and the Roosevelt administration as three of the most important groups who have pressing or are pressing this country towards war. In the first settlement, in the first, there was a strong sentiment that Europe's, it was Europe's problem and not ours. America remembered what it had lost in World War I. We were only in the war for 17 months and lost over half a million soldiers. Many people were not willing to rescue Europe again. German and Italian families initially collected funds and sent packages to their homeland. In Yorkville section of Manhattan, that's the Upper East Side from the 80s down to the 70s, um, Bund meetings were regularly conducted in German to encourage participants to donate and contribute to the war funds. At Madison Square Garden, the Nazis held a rally. And during, during, interestingly, during my time in the Army, I was stationed in New York City in military intelligence in the late 60s and early 70s. And we had a liaison with the FBI. And the FBI told us that during World War II, there were more FBI agents in Yorkville, the Yorkville section of Manhattan, per square foot than any other place in the country because there was such a huge German population there, fundraising German population. Support for the Nazi regime in the 1930s ranged far beyond the German-American in, in Yorkville. At Brooklyn Prospect Hall on German Youth Day and at the Bund Camp Siegfried on Long Island, families reveled in Nazi culture. Thousands of them boarded the Long Island Railroad on Sunday mornings, catching the Camp Siegfried special from Penn Station to Yapank. They danced and sang Nazi hymns, Horst Vi the Nazi hymn, Horst Wissel, song I'm probably saying that wrong, and strolled among paths named for Nazi party leaders like Adolf Hitler, Hermann Goring, and Joseph Goebbels. In 1937, the year that this photograph was taken, the FBI estimated that the Bund national membership was 75,000 people most of them living in the five boroughs of Manhattan. In East Harlem, Italian-American residents celebrated Italy's conquest 
of Ethiopia in May of 1936. Benedito Mussolini promised to restore the fascist Italy to world prominence, preeminence, and attracted many New Yorkers. Italian community leaders like Generoso Pope, publisher El Progresso and Italio Americano, stored admiration for El Duce's imperialist exploits. Opponents of German, Italian, and Japanese aggression stepped up their efforts in a country by country fell by Axis control. Concerned, uh, individuals, left-wing unions, political organizations, professional and business associates, and President Roosevelt himself campaigned to counter Axis aid or intervention. On the other side, on the other side were efforts um, to support future allies engaged in the war. The British Relief Society solicited clothes and food to help their war effort. Remember, the, the British are being bombed now. Uh, the Nazis bombing started, I think it's September of 1940, ends about May of 1941, the Blitz it was called. A New York socialite founded the Bundles for Britain to aid victims in the Blitz, the Nazi bombing of, of German cities that attempted unsuccessfully to clear the way for an invasion. The Blitz lasted, as I said, from September 1940 to May of 41, killing tens of thousands and leaving more than, more than many more homeless. The Bundles contained used clothing, air raid shelter cots, medical equipment, and other desperately needed supplies which the organization's 270 chapters collected and sent overseas in merchant ships. Aid was also sent to China, which was being systematically destroyed by the Japanese. Japanese Americans and friends of China rushed to the aid of their country after the Japanese invaded in July of 1937. That November, a war relief drive in New York's Chinatown attracted 2,000 participants. The following May, after the brutal rape of Nanking, 12,000 marched, and in each parade, bystanders threw coins and bills in a huge nationalist Chinese flag, which women carried through the streets. By the summer of 1939, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, headquartered at 16 Mott Street, raised about one and a half million dollars to send to China to help victims and supply the troops. New York rallied to the aid of victims at the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, the fascist uprising that became the prologue to World War II. They sent humanitarian aid such as ambulances and over 1,000 men and women to join the Abraham Lincoln Brigade to support the Republican government that was the elected government of Spain at that time. After the fascist victory, the Museum of Modern Art took refuge of Guernica, Pablo Picasso's painting of the bombing of Spanish civilians. Guernica returned to Spain in 1981 with the restoration of democracy. Another point from my military service, as late as the early 1970s on the Attorney General's list of, of, su of suppressive organizations, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade was still on there. Most of these people weren't alive at that point, but they still had them on the AG list. In January of 1971, Roosevelt had negotiated with Great Britain a Lend-Lease program where the United States would supply arms to Great Britain, which was in the middle of the fam infamous Nazi blitz, blitz, blitz. The United States would provide aircraft and ships no longer of use to the United States to Britain who would return them after the war. Neither country believed that the equipment would not be of use to America or would be in any shape to be returned after the war but England was fighting for its existence. The United States had dipped its foot into the war waters. On September 9th, more than 100 British, Dutch, and Norwegian merchant ships passed through the narrows of the New York Harbor on their way across the Atlantic. The convoy carried war materials and other goods for the British who promised to repay the United States after the war. The Lend-Lease Agreement alarmed those who feared that it would, drew the, would draw the United States into war. Interventionists like President Roosevelt and Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia argued that aiding London and Moscow in the end might stop the Nazis without the need of American troops. On December 8th, 
things began to change almost overnight. One of the first activities happened at Columbia University's physics department. Professor John R. Dunning had been experimenting with neutrons. Fortunately, that department had two immigrants that would play a significant role in the race to control nuclear energy. The first was Enrico Fermi, an Italian who had just won the Nobel Prize for, for physics in 1938. Fermi, seeing the rise of Mussolini to power, took the prize money and moved to the United States with his Jewish wife and Jewish daughter. Fermi's studies had shown that the neutron transformation occurred in almost every element subjected to neutron bombardment and would change with constant pressure. Columbia built a 22-ton cyclotron. We actually had this at the museum, and that's the picture of us loading it in. Uh, a cyclotron to create the explosion of the neutrons needed to split the atom. The second immigrant, a physicist, arrived shortly after Fermi. Leo Zillard was born and educated in Budapest, Hungary, before stuttering, studying in Germany. While Szilard was not the scientist that Fermi was, he was active in Germany's attempt to build a nuclear weapon and, for and importantly knew just how far Germany was in the development stage. Szilard, picture here with Albert Einstein, uh, warns Columbia and the Defense Department that the winner of this race to split the atom and create the world's most devastating bomb will win the war. Albert Einstein sent a letter to President Roosevelt, a letter I might admit that he greatly regretted after the war, asking Roosevelt to, to put money and government funds behind the development of splitting the atom and ultimately the nuclear weapon. In the letter dated August 2, 1939, Einstein and concerned colleagues in, informed President Roosevelt about the scientific breakthroughs involving uranium that could lead to a new, extremely powerful bomb. Einstein proposed that communications be established with a group of physicists and work on a chain reaction in America and explain that additional funds would speed their progress. He earned, urged the president to act quickly, lest most of the world's uranium supply fall in the hands of the Third Reich. The letter reached FDR in October. By then, Germany had invaded Poland, and the European war had begun. Grasping the urgency of the situation, Roosevelt established an advisory committee on uranium to support the scientists' work. Shortly at, thereafter, the government supported and funded the project that would be known as the Manhattan Project. That project would expand beyond the confines of Columbia to the University of Chicago, ending on the testing grounds of Los Alamos, New Mexico. On December 8th and 9th, recruits swamped the military offices. About 3,000 originally signed up um, this, is an, this is not necessarily military people, but these are civilians uh, volunteering to relocate to Pearl Harbor to help rebuild Pearl. Eventually, 900,000 New Yorkers would leave civilian life for the military. 60,000 would make the ultimate sacrifice. New York City's Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia took on added responsibilities of the Office of Civil Defense, a position he held for 15 months. In 1940, Roosevelt called upon America to become the arsenal of democracy. With the country now at war, um, the, on the home front, the home front used the nation's immense industrial infrastructure to produce ships, guns, and planes that FDR had asked for. New York and the metropolitan region contributed mightily to that common cause. In 1942, the city is transformed from a city whose economy is strangled by the Great Depression to a city bursting with businesses, many of them war-related. With so many men in the military, suddenly there was a shortage of personnel to fill new jobs. The city experienced an avalanche of job seekers 
from all areas of the country, from small towns and big cities. New York is the first city to pull out of the Great Depression and was offering good, well-paying jobs to a nation starving for them. By 1943, there was a severe housing shortage to accommodate the job seekers arriving from elsewhere. The war in the North Atlantic went very badly in the United States in 1942. The infamous U-boats, German U-boats, submarines, caused enormous damage to both civilian and military shipping. On January 1942, a U-boat commander by the name of Reinhard Hartigan slipped past the outer security of Long Island's defenses and submerged in the New York Harbor. Hartigan was dumbfounded by the sight of the New York skyline being lit up as if the country was not at war. In fact, he was so angry that he thought the United States was arrogant to, light, to, to continue to light the, the skyline the way they did. In confusion, he could not find his target, so he left, and in the wake of his trip back to um, Germany, he managed to sink six, seven ships and was welcomed back as a war hero. Hartigan's intrusion into the New York waters inaugurated six months of unrelenting U-boat attacks. One U-boat mined the harbor's entrance, while others sunk merchant ships laden with war supplies. He wrote a book about his wartime experiences, and America's answer to the destruction of the U-boats that were, were happening right here uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, just as New York went into a blackout mode. In 1942, after the Japanese attack of Pearl Harbor, the United States uh, and brought the United States into the fight, President Franklin Roosevelt spoke to 61 million Americans in one of his radio fireside chats. He urged them to study maps of the world, for unlike wars of the past, this one will be fought on every continent, every island, every sea, every airline in the world. And Brooklyn was ready. The Brooklyn Navy Yard went into full production starting with two work shifts, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. The Navy Yard was, had built and repaired ships for decades, but after Pearl Harbor, the need to replace the ships lost, lost at Pearl was paramount to winning the war in the North Atlantic. Spanning 219 acres, the Brooklyn Navy Yard was the largest shipbuilding facility in the country. It supplied the Navy with floating workshops, tank landing ships, LSTs they were called, aircraft carriers, and battleships. Smaller Allied vessels also docked in Brooklyn for supplies and repairs. At the height of the production, the, the yard, which operated 24 hours a day, employed 75,000 men and women. Women left their homes to fill jobs that were vacant because over a million men were in uniform. First time female workers could leave their flag sewing departments for higher paying yard jobs such as ship fitting and welding. This was the first time that women would leave their homes and, and take factory jobs normally filled by men. Brooklyn's constant flow of new ships uh, while repairing damaged ones got them back into the fight. In 1941, the Navy Yard production was as follows, 13 ships. 1942, 3,747 ships. 1943, 7,039 ships. 1944, 7,541 ships. And finally, in 1945, 3,119. With the powerful and plentiful German U-boats controlling the North Atlantic, American carrier ships filled with soldiers and cargo ships loaded with supplies were having a difficult time reaching Europe. Through 1942, the North Atlantic was controlled by the German Navy. The breakthrough for the U.S. Navy occurred the following year. Brooklyn produced smaller ships that could be used as convoys, maybe 10 or 15 that would accompany troop and supply ships, and counter the U-boats by dropping deadly depth chargers in the area where they knew the submarines were located. The other breakthrough was the Enigma. The Enigma, the second breakthrough, let us know where the U-boats were located, and the breakthrough was accomplished to an, import, to an important spy work. The Americans managed to capture the German Enigma 
coding machine, the device by which all major communication between German headquarters and the Army and Naval and Air Forces of Germany transpired. When the Enigma code, with the Enigma code, the US Navy could now successfully estimate where the enemy was patrolling and defend its carriers. Now spymaster, Colonel William Wild Bill Donovan, a New Yorker, established the Office of Strategic Services in Rockefeller Center just down the hall from the British intelligence operation. The OSS directed overseas espionage operations, which included planting agents, analyzing secret intelligence, and supplying partisan resistance. The success of the OSS inspired the creation of the CIA. By the end of 1943 and into 1944, the United States controlled the North Atlantic. By the war's end, 5,151 Allied merchant ships and warships laid at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Joining them were 759 U-boats, about 70% of the U-boat force. The United States Merchant Marines lost 9,525 men on a percentage basis that most lost of any of the armed services in that particular war. Despite the dangers they endured and the significant role they played in the Allied victory, the men of the Merchant Marines were not granted veteran status until 1988. With the government supporting businesses and encouraging the change over civilian and military production, another issue arises. Do African Americans, too old or young to fight, get equal opportunity at the jobs the, government's, the government is supporting in the war effort? As early as May of 1941, black leaders, including A. Philip Randolph, A. Philip Randolph was the head of the Pullman Union, the Porter's Union and the railroads, met with Eleanor Roosevelt and members of the president's cabinet. They threatened to originate a march on Washington, D.C., 100,000 strong, if the president failed to intervene. President Roosevelt, the New Yorker in him, signed the executive order 8802, which called for the Fair Employment Act on June 25, 1941. The order prohibited racial discrimination on all federal agencies, unions, and companies engaged in war work. It was also established the Fair Employment Practice Commission to ensure that the order was carried out. The Executive Order 8802 marked the first time that the federal government officially acted to stop employment discrimination in the United States. It came in a time when large numbers of black Americans sought jobs in the burgeoning war industry and were frequently met with violence and unfair labor practices. Another industry was put on war fitting, footing and that was the airplane industry. New York had a number of factories in the metropolitan area. The three biggest were Grumman in Long Island, Republic Aeronautics, and Brewster Aeronautics in Queens. And, and there also was air-related production companies that also tied into this. In 1939, two years before our entry into the war, the country produced about 5,000 airplanes. In 1942, the number jumped up to 50,000 airplanes. By 1943, it reached an unfathomable number of 100,000 airplanes. This was the one aspect of American industry that the Japanese did not account for when they destroyed the ships and planes at Pearl Harbor. We were called the arsenal of democracy. Airplanes were not the only air-related weapons in the area. Here's a picture of Grumman here. In the lower part of Manhattan on 80 Lafayette Street, the Nordum Company had made a device so secret that its existence had to be kept from the enemies at all cost. The Nordum bomb site, a system that allowed it to directly measure aircraft ground speed and direction, and by using an analog computer that constantly calculated the bomb's impact point based on current flight conditions and an autopilot that it would let react quickly and accurately to changes of wind or other F effects. The accuracy would, would allow direct attacks on ships, factories, and other points, point targets. Both the Navy and the United States Air Force saw this as a mean to achieve war aims through high altitude bombing, for instance, destroying an invasion fleet long before it could reach the US shores. <clears throat> 
The Nordum was granted the utmost secrecy well into the war and was part of the then unprecedented production effort on the same scale as the Manhattan Project. If a plane carrying a Nordum was shot down, it was the job of the crew to destroy it or take it with them rather than have it fall into enemy hands. Sperry's gyroscope in Nassau County factory opened in 1942 and employed 8,000 New Yorkers. The company produced artificial horizons, bomb sites, atomic pilots, radar, ball turrets, gun sights, and other components for US aircraft. The K-14B gun sight enabled P-52 Mustangs and Republic's Thunderbolt pilots to aim their machine guns and hit targets accurately. Once a pilot identified an enemy plane, he selected the wingspan from a dial and tracked the target with its sight. The K-14B then computed the, the correct range and the required lead. Other aircraft craft instrument panels, including gauges from Eclipse Pioneer uh, Instrument of New Jersey, Coleman's Aircraft Instruments in Queens. At the height of production, Eclipse Pioneer supplied Allied Air Force's 70 different aircraft instruments and engine components at the rate of 375,000 per month. Elko Division of the Electric Boats in Bayonne, New Jersey built patrol torpedoes or PT boats, including the PT-109 that Lieutenant and future President John F. Kennedy commanded in the Solomon Islands. The PT boats were designated to attack enemy surface ships. IBM, the business machine operator, changes machinery to manufacture the M1 rifle, the principal rifle of infantry soldiers. They manufactured it in Rochester, in Endicott, New York, which is near Binghamton, and in Poughkeepsie. Penicillin had been discovered by Alexander Fleming, um, a professor of bacteriology in St. Mary's Hospital in London in 1928. He won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the discovery. Its original production took a long time to produce a very small amount, but it was called the miracle drug. Charles Pfizer and company in late 1930 began to experiment on producing the drug faster in greater quantities. The 1943 Pfizer decided to, to gamble when it purchased the old Rubel ice plant in Marcy Avenue in Brooklyn, a building that had been refriger had refrigerator equipment required by Pfizer. They reconstructed the building into the world's largest scale penicillin factory. On March 1, 1944, penicillin plants opened. It contained 14 7,500-gallon tanks, and soon the company was producing five times more penicillin than originally estimated, making Pfizer the leading producer of the drug. Most of the penicillin that went ashore with the Allies on D-Days came from that plant. There's a story about a GI who suffered a terrible leg wound. The doctor looked at it and he said, I'm probably going to have to take the leg off, but I got this drug here. I'm not sure how it works. Let me apply it. You have nothing to lose. A week later, there was a considerable clearing of the wound. Two weeks later, it had cleaned up. He realized it really was a miracle drug and it saved the GI's leg. M&Ms, made in Newark, manufactured M&M candies for soldiers and sea rations and post exchanges and ship service stores. Patented in 1941, the candy traveled well and withstood the heat of the Pacific. Remember, it melts in your mouth, not in your hands. <laughs> E.R. Squibb and Sons in Brooklyn and New Brunswick developed and produced uh, sirets, uh, hypodermic units of, units of morphine that wounded soldiers self-administered in the battlefield. General Foods made non-perishable K rations, the main source of food on the front lines. The dinners contain, contained canned meat, cheese, biscuits, malted milk, tablets, sugar, salt, cigarettes, chewing gum, and powdered beverages. The Jewish, war, the Jewish Welfare Board assembled religious kits for Jewish uh, servicemen. New York City's museums contributed to the, uh, to the war. The Red Cross using nurses working in the New York Historical Society where they made enrolled over millions of bandages during the war. In 1944 alone, the nurses made enrolled four million surgical sponges. 
Metropolitan Museum cast aside art and made helmets for the GIs. The Museum of Modern Art made campaign and propaganda posters for the government, and other museums did their part. At New York University and Pratt Institute, students and prof professionals in engineering and architecture and related disciplines aided the military in working with camouflage terrain, model making, and more. NYU had a special five-week course for industrial camouflage. Pratt set up an experimental research lab. Rationing was a way of life in New York, in all of New York, and certainly the United States. Gasoline, food, fabric, metal, and wartime essentials were rationed to prevent inflation, hoarding, and profiteering. The new Office of Price Administration sent maximum prices and issued ration books to restrict consumption. Every household member received his or hers own ration book with stamps. Stamps were not money, but they authorized the purchase of rationed goods with cash. Tokens came along in 1944 and made the change from stamps. Ration stamps had point values. Consumer goods were assigned point values, which fluctuated with supply and demand. It was a complicated system, and perplexed New Yorkers could tune in to Mayor LaGuardia's talk of the people on WNYC radio when he announced shortages and explained the rules. With so many men fighting in the armed services and uh, open Armed services opened military organizations to women to join the fight. The waves and wax were trained to assume some of the desk functions that the main men would normally do under, but under wartime conditions were in field operations. The waves uh, were trained at Hunter College in the Bronx. Um, and they vacated the campus so 80,000 women could be trained over the course of the year. They were trained in many military positions for office work. Training went out throughout the war. Some women who showed great understanding of codes and dissemination of information were used in intelligence functions. They were partly uh, to, to, to locate where the wolf pack was, the U-boats were, and put that on a map and transmit that to the um, to naval ships. The Navy established a midshipman school at Columbia University in 1940 to train officers. These 90-day wonders learned navigation and engineering, receiving an ensign's commission upon completion. In late 1943, the training program had become the nation's largest midshipman school. At Fort Schuyler in Bronx and Kings Point, Long Island, two maritime academies came under ju Navy jurisdiction during the war. Navy Reserve officer candidates trained at Fort Schuyler in New York State's Maritime College. Apprentice midshipmen trained across the Sound in the United States Merchant Academy. Because New York was a major embarkation point for GIs fighting in Europe, the many forts around the metropolitan area were packed with soldiers. Entertainment was a medium that could keep the GIs occupied as they awaited their transfers overseas. Stage door cantinas were a place where GIs could relax. The Billy Rose Theatrical Division, where Broadway entertainers would visit to share some companionship. The New York Public Library for Performing Arts also offered the same. New York's USO operations was one of the finest in the States, and I can attest that they were the finest in the Vietnam War era, uh, where servicemen could enjoy some downtime. Men and women in uniform could not buy drinks or meals in most of the famous restaurants. They were treated as guests and everything was free. They enjoyed free passes to the theater, to movies, and to sporting events. Broadway itself became a military experience. The Army wanted a play on Broadway to show the GI experience, and they hired the redoubtable Irving Berlin who fashioned a musical called This is the Army. It ran over a year and then went across the country collecting millions of dollars for military use. The, Navy, the Air Force wanted the same. They hired Moss Hart, uh, and he accepted the challenge, and he created a show called Winged Victory, which resulted was so successful that George Cooker, the motion picture director, adapted it for movies. Um, Hart made the, wrote the script for the movies. That's a picture of the cantinas uh, and Ebbets Field with a V for victory on top of the, uh, on top of the stadium. This is a painting by Thomas Hart Benson. It's called Prelude to Death. Whenever I gave the tour, 
in the historical society about this exhibition and I saw that, I always stopped and thought that 3.3 million soldiers left from New York to go to Europe. And there were soldiers that looked back as New York was fading, uh, as the ship pulled away and was fading from its view. And some of those soldiers never saw the country again. Benton's uh, picture emphasized the critical role that New York City played in embarkation. Benton based his canvas on his sketches made in Brooklyn in August of 1942 as the first American troops prepared to depart for North Africa. Many of New York City's 900,000 citizens became soldiers, and among the 3,300,000 troops that were shipped out of the great, its great harbor, the country's principal war port to battlefields in Europe and North Africa. Many soldiers and sailors who embarked there survived their service uh, survived their service, would not return home until the end of the war. Before embarkation came along, America faced the daunting task of quickly preparing millions of men and women to fight behind the front lines. Basic and advanced training facilities sprang up in the city. Outfits like the Navy used the allure of New York City to attract recruits, and all services took advantage of the local talent industry and educational institutions. Two large army staving camps, one Camp Wilmer, uh, in Kilmer in New Jersey and Camp Shanks in Rockland County um, processed and prepared most of the troops to ship out of New York. A brief stay in these camps often included recreational excursions into the city where the troops came, boarded trucks, uh, the orders came, uh, troops boarded trucks, trains, and ferry boats and carried them into their waiting troop ships. The most famous pre-war ocean, ocean liner row, it went from Piers 84 to 92, from 42nd to 52nd Streets uh, in Manhattan were the primary embarkation point for troops headed overseas. Giant liners like the Queen Mary and her sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, trans transported entire infantry divisions, roughly 15,000 men with their gear. The Queen Mary traveled at speeds up to 28 knots, so fast that no U-boat could catch her, nor could naval escorts keep up. So the huge ships often sailed alone, departed New York under strict secrecy. Modifications of the Queen Mary stateroom added rows of bunks stacked five to 10 feet high. When the war ended, these troops performed the same jobs in reverse. Merchant ships, Captains gathered at the port director's office in Whitehall building prior to each convoy departure to collect their orders and the latest intelligence information regarding U-boat activities. These briefings were one way that the port director, responsible for organizing and coordinating uh, convoy operations, tried to protect each ship heading overseas. At Port Johnson Terminal in Bayonne, men and women prepared tanks, jeeps, and other combat vehicles for travel. Vehicles were greased, oiled, repainted, and, ru and rough-proofed. Process of vehicles could, would extend, could ex withstand ocean weather for six months, and they were ready for combat within 30 minutes. On April 2, 1945, in Warren Springs, Georgia, Franklin Roosevelt died of a massive stroke. When Adolf Hitler heard the news, he was certain that Roosevelt's death was a signal from God that Germany would win the war. One month later, Hitler was dead. On August 6th and 9th, the United States completed its task um, that started years before um, called the Manhattan Project by dropping two bombs, one on Hiroshima and the other on Nagasaki. The Japanese surrendered on the USS Missouri, it was built in Brooklyn, and they chose it because the president, Harry Truman, was a senator from Missouri. Incre Interestingly enough, the Army and Naval Forces of Japan did not want to surrender after the Nagasaki bomb. The emperor forced them to surrender. The celebration across the country was monumental. None more in New York City. This is a letter by the way, I should have said this earlier, this is a letter that Eisenhower, General Eisenhower sent on May 7th, 1945 to Harry Truman. And it said very simply, the mission of the Allied forces was fulfilled at 3 a.m. local time. 
the war in Europe was over. And they celebrated it in New York. During the dis discussion, uh, and then of course, the celebration of VJ Day. The nurse d died, I think, two years ago. She lived in California. She was in her 90s. Um, she, didn't, she didn't remember much about the kiss other than the fact that she was there. <laughs> During this discussion, I've talked about some of the companies that made contributions to the war, but by no means not all of them. There were hundreds in the, in the New York area, companies that offered significant assistance in the war. Companies like Brooks Brothers, who made military uniforms. Whitehall Pharmaceutical, who made special toothpaste. The Men and Company in Newark that made Quinsana and antifungal power. Dade Brothers transport planes who flew troops from Long Island to the point of embarkation. The Lionel Company, who made Navy uh, boat compasses, and even the longshoremen from New York and New Jersey all made efforts and contributions towards the war effort. It seems that every major company in the metropolitan area did something to ensure victory. It was a concerted effort by the entire region to come together as one to back our cause. And I'm going to leave you with a philosophical thought. If New York City did not exist, if the metropolitan wasn't there, could we have won the war without him? I'm happy to say it's a philosophical argument, not a real one. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, comments? Ma'am. Uh, that was, I didn't include that in there. It's very simply, the FDR was built on the rubble that was created in London. They shipped it over. When the ships came over from the Blitz, when the ships came over with the lend lease, they had to come back. And rather than come back empty, they came back with the rubble. So they would be you know, at sea level. So they used that rubble to build the FDR. I, I have a home in Nantucket, and, and the main streets in Nantucket are all these huge rocky boulders, and it was the same thing. When the ships came back from delivering something, they were high in the water, so they put rocks in there for ballast. They had sand in the street, so they replaced the sand with the rocks. Still not easy to ride over. Did you have a question, Chief? Oh. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, boy. It depends on the size of it, but they could probably build the smaller ones in three to five months. They could build the major battleships in probably a year. I mean, there's 75,000 people, and it was assembly line work. I mean, that's the one factor the Japanese never considered. The only one that, that was General uh, Admiral Yamada, who actually had studied here in the United States. He knew that Pearl Harbor was a mistake, um, and he knew that the United States would respond uh, terribly. Yes? Is there any truth to the story about the Long that, that is true. That was part of the U-boat thing. They did land there. It's, it's right out of, uh, what was the 1960 movie, The Russians Are Coming. They, they arrived here. They had terrible maps. They had terrible clothes. They got lost. I think there were six of them. Three were captured within a week or two. Uh, the other three lasted another couple weeks, but all six of them were eventually captured. They did no damage. They didn't know where they were going, even. I mean, the maps that they had were so old and so inaccurate. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He worked for NBC for years. Wow. Wow.
Mm-hmm. You know what they said? You know what the London said about that? The Yanks are over here. They're overpaid, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> oh. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's a good question. Um, the night that this opened, a lady stopped me and said to me, where are the interviews? And I said, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. And I called one of the curators over, and he said, come here, I'll show you. It was an interview with her. She was a child. There was a knock on the door. Her father was born in Germany. FBI came in and arrested him. Uh, they lived briefly at Ellis Island, and then they went to some godforsaken place in Texas for the rest of the war. There were not as many... Germans or Italians by any means, 120,000 Japanese were interred. 80,000 of those were American citizens. Part of the reason, part of the rationale, it was, certainly was totally illegal, but part of the rationale was they, the Army, the Navy thought that the Japanese were going to bomb the West Coast. So they thought that those Japanese might be sympathetic. It was totally illegal. It went to the Supreme Court, the Kiramatsu case, the court decided, I think, by a 7-2 to two, uh, verdict in favor of the government. And interestingly enough, the governor of California who signed the internment before Franklin Roosevelt, Earl Warren. Uh, right. 120,000 for absolutely illegal, uh, 80,000 or more citizens. It was absolutely illegal. They were a little bit more established, and, and I don't think that they thought that was a bigger threat that the Germans or Italians would attack the East Coast. Sir? They might have gotten that far. I don't know. I mean, they certainly there were no bombers there. There might have been ships that got that far. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I've heard something about that. I heard something in Washington State, too, but I... I don't. I can't say for sure. I don't know. That could very well be. Yeah, that could very well be. Any other thoughts, questions? Well, folks, thank you. You've been a w back there. Yep. Pardon me. There was also a permanent assignment in Radio City because Radio City had a lift that could bring the stage up and the mechanism was quite unique. So there were soldiers that were stationed there during the war. I don't think that was called hardship duty, but, but they were there through the whole time. Yes, ma'am. I guess so. I don't know that London wants it back. Uh, I guess so. Um, there was another ship, a German ship, and I forgot its name, that was here in port, and they were going to, it was a luxury ship, I forgot its name, and, and it caught fire, and it basically was destroyed before we could use it as a transport ship. It was here when, when Ge Germany declared war in the United States, so we confiscated it as war reparation. Uh, but I, I think it's going to stay there. Yeah, I, I don't know what plans they have for it. Yes, ma'am. The what? Pa pardon? <laughs> Gave him candy. <laughs> the, I'm, I'm not, I don't know the name. The Metsonia? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the ship at all. Don't know the ship at all. Most of that, sadly enough, in the 19, late 1950s, the Southern Democrats became um, um, chairmen of the various military committees, and they moved all that stuff out. Uh, most of the, I think, the biggest military shipbuilding areas in the godforsaken place in Mississippi now. 
because they have they had the power, you know, and they lost. New York State lost it. Yes, sir. Well, we weren't at war with them yet. And I guess we'd sell fuel. You know what Karl Marx said, the United States will sell you the rope they used to hang them, we'll use to hang them with. And certainly in that point, before the war, we, would, we were open, although we were certainly pushing to, to back England once the blitz started. But yeah, they probably would. They could probably come into port there. They came in South America, probably. Well, folks, thank you. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.